You're listening to Remotely We Are One, a podcast to help inspire others to take their lives back from the office commute. I'm Rick, a passionate beer rep who loves the industry, but hates the commute. And I'm Colleen, a remote work advocate and consultant. We're going to speak with some of the top professionals who have managed to avoid the commute as they share stories from the most inspiring to the most comical, all while working remotely. Man, this sounds exciting. Let's clock in. Rick, how's it going? My brother, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I complain all the time, but nobody listens. <laughs> 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 you both have the blue background there. So are you cross from each other or? No, he refuses to do anything out of the ordinary. So we have to be like absolutely strict about our appearances. Hey, it's branding. You know, it's important. <laughs> he was adamant that I would be black, but I can't do that. So I just... <laughs> that might take a little bit more time. <laughs> You're very opposite of me. You're so pasty. I am. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the the good news is you're you're well moisturized and I'm not. <laughs> yes, we've we've definitely co- we've great. definitely covered that for sure. You look good today, though, Rick. Sorry, sorry, I don't get a chance to talk to Rick that often, so hey. it's almost like you know we we just reconnect. You know what I mean? It's mm. it's good. It's good energy. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have fun. Awesome. Welcome, everyone, to Remotely One. I am your host, Rick Haney, joined by the Honorable Kaleem Clarkson. Hey, Kaleem. What's going on, man? Going on, man? Like, oh, the man. Remotely One podcast. We're, we're not going to we're not gonna jumble up our mouth anymore. I love it. Oh, I love it. we will, and that's going to be the fun part. But <laughs> it is what it is, right? Yes, I love it. I, lo- I love it. It feels much smoother. You're absolutely right. Like, the Remotely One podcast. Simple. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, everybody, since you know how to find us now, do us a huge favor, would you? Go to ratethispodcast.com forward slash remotely one. If you could do that for us, we would be ever so grateful. Please. And it would be amazing. Thank you. Appreciate you. Since 2015, Remotely One is one of the largest communities of remote work professionals with over 2,500 Slack members and 4,000 email subscribers. Is it really that high? Wow. That's great. Yes. It's free to join. Free to join. So go ahead, check it out at remotelyone.com. And with that out of the way, Kaleem, give us a tease or two about today's guest. You know, every single time we have these guests, I feel like I'm not going to be nervous. You know what I'm saying? Like, I see it. I see the little beads of sweat. I get these jitters. The problem is our guest today, I mean, you viewers, my man's just, he's got his setup right. You know what I mean? He looked right. He's smart. You know, brother was smart. It's intimidating. So our guest today, he's from New York, right? He's from New York, a.k.a. The city, son. Oh, you must be in Manhattan. There it is. He's from Manhattan, oh. the city. Oh, I got you. You know, I feel like a New Yorker now. Yeah. <laughs> He's an avid snowboarder, and he learned to snowboard on the east side. So for all you skiers out there, you know what he's talking about. Icy as shit out here. You know what I mean? <laughs> Nothing but chunky snow, folks. Chunky snow on the east coast. That's slip, what we slip, do. Slip and fall. <laughs> Oh, he's almost broken all of his fingers playing flag football. You don't hear that very often. That's really yeah. great. That's an amazing little tidbit. He says he has good hands, but obviously his hands aren't good if he's broken all of his fingers, right? I, I mean, think like... what he meant was he he used to have good hands. <laughs> now he just has hands. Do you think our guest hands look like Shaquille O'Neal's feet? I mean... I would imagine so. Anyway, um, today's guest has been featured in... Just a couple of publications, no big deal. Fast Company, Business Insider, Tech Crunch, and all sorts no. of other ones. That's right. Holy cow. That's right. Last but not least, he is the founder and CEO of Hopscotch. Viewers, listeners, please give a warm welcome to Reed Schweitzer. Yeah. 
Ah, let's welcome go, aboard, let's Good go, to have you. baby, let's go. It was hard making it through that intro with it, you know, not saying anything. <laughs> oh, you should have said something. Yeah, I wanted to, I had to defend myself. <laughs> I, I didn't know. I thought it was the intro. The intro is supposed to be silent and wait for us to. Oh to God, no. Oh, oh uh, God, no! But this is even better. No. Defend yourself, sir. Defend yourself. I'm glad you when you said the four thousand, you had the ad libs in there. I was like, when you're saying remotely one, we should have like some fireworks in the background, some sound right? effects. I it. want to. I want to. Well, sorry, you need to defend yourself. No, my so my fingers do not look like Jack. <laughs> oh, thank God. Is, oh, thank God. <laughs> There's absolutely, well, hey, I mean, Shaq, if, if you're listening out there, I mean, you, you I, I don't know what to say, actually. Yeah, Shaq, we'll have you on the show anytime, and if you need, you know, some payment process, and we'll hook you up. But yeah, yeah I mean, Shaq's feet's documented as yeah, right. severely ugly. All right. To give the background there, I play baseball. I used to play baseball. I was a center fielder. Well, I played outfield. You know, center field was my favorite. Hurt my shoulder, which is sort of took me out of the sport, but loved playing football and flag football. My hands are good, right? I can catch, but for whatever reason, whenever we played with a foam football when I was younger, I just always broke my finger. But when it was a regular football, then, you know, it was totally fine. So amazing. Uh, maybe you'll have to get on the field and prove myself at some point. No, oh, I believe you. I believe you. I could just tell you like, yeah, you want some of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Randy Moss you and I do not want to get mossed. Okay. I do not want to get mossed. <laughs> well, you guys both played football. So, you know, that's... Uh... Yeah. I don't know. It, Kaleem played way more than I did. I was more of a sideline joker, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the uh, sidelines because I was too busy making fun of the coaches. Yeah. You're good at that, though. Well, hey, none of the coaches have a podcast with 2,000 downloads, so... Oh, 2,000, baby! I want to give you such a big hug right now. I love you, baby. <laughs> I love you. Now we're talking, right? Sorry. Sorry. It's all good, man. Read your super sport for putting up with our uh, juvenile behavior thus far, and I can't thank you enough. Uh, back to you, of course. You are our guest today, and you have been through some stuff. Walk me through the process of not only your experience with remote work, but what was it that kind of led to your founding, you know, going with Hopscotch? Yeah, so... I guess I'll, I'll answer two pieces to that and sort of tell the, the, the background of how I arrived at Hopscotch. So in terms of remote work, like before Hopscotch, I used to work at a music streaming startup that was founded by the former CFO of Combs Enterprises. This is while I was in school. Wait, whoa. Combs, yes, P. Diddy. Like Puffy? P. Diddy? Yes, P. Diddy. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. I was working alongside him for... About three and a half years or so. And while I was in school, I was just, you know, inherently you have to work remotely, right? Because you're in school. I wasn't able to go into the office all the time. So a lot of the work I would do would be, you know, at home on my computer or at school on my computer, et cetera. But it was a lot of the experiences that I had there. And then also prior to that, you know, starting an apparel company with a few friends that seeded the idea for Hopscotch, you know, someone who uses Venmo Cash App on a daily basis seeing what b2b payments were like in those two earlier experiences you know it was clear that someone needed to go out there and build a better b2b payments experience and so uh dropped out of school to found hopscotch wow dropped out of school to found hopscotch not any school rick not just like you know no 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 shade to my previous school not like you know but you know what i'm saying not like xyz school but uh you know just just a little business school yeah. The Wharton School of Business. He's like, no, son. Uh, wow. Peace out. I'm done. I'm done with you, Wharton. I got this shit figured out. Holy yeah. shit. What am I doing with my life? Half our age could be our son, Rick. <laughs> yeah, that was... Uh... Such a way with words. <laughs> I mean, the awesome thing is that at that school, there's so many people that do that, right? There's so many awesome companies and awesome entrepreneurs. Yeah. That are building there so i think it being in that environment just made it a lot easier to leave and then also it's just you know obviously very passionate about hopscotch and uh the opportunity that we have yeah left now two years ago so yeah just crossed the two-year mark two years ago so you're very much in the infancy stage of business i'm dying to know have you had any moments where you're just staring at the screen wondering if you did the right thing like obviously now you did know you do know now that you did the right thing but were there any moments leading up to this where you were like oh man i 
did I do the right thing? Yeah. Um, yes, a ton of times, probably once a week. <laughs> yeah. Not once a day. But but I think that's good, right? That self-reflection is how you end up building a better business and making it like you should, if you're not questioning yourself, you know, you should question whether or not you're sane, right? I think it's always good to double check and do sort of a gut check on the decisions that you're making. Don't like mm -hmm. sort of constantly think about past decisions, but always check in with yourself and see if you're approaching things the right way. But yeah, it was tough. It took us about seven months to raise our initial funding to even just be able to go build the initial product were a lot of rejections. And so throughout that process, you have like all of these people who are these professional investors saying, no, your idea won't work for X, Y, or Z reason. And you have to keep telling yourself that, hey, no, they're wrong. I know what I'm doing and I know the value that I bring to the table. And, you know, not put this wall around you, but just have enough fuel in the tank to keep going. Reed, I got a question in regards to like, you know, I did a, a long sit in higher education and, um, I still firmly believe in higher education, but for different reasons than I think a lot of academics would. I'm just curious, what's your view on higher ed and do you still see value for higher education? Yeah. So the short answer is yes. I think 100%. I got a lot of value out of higher education, right? Just in the short time that I was there. I think college isn't for everyone right? I think people come into college with different needs, with different wants of what they want to get out of that experience. And you sort of just have to be in tune with yourself and what you want to get out of it and what you want to get out of life and make the mm. best decision for you. So like the networking skills, the, you know, exposure to different spaces and ideas, like all of that is critical in someone's development. But for me, having started, you know, a company early on and being a part of then, you know, another startup and just getting exposed to that space, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And so whether or not I spent four years at an institution studying how to do it, or if I just, you know, went out and did it right away, I think I'd be doing the same thing that I am now. Yeah, that's interesting. And there's a, a thing I didn't want to mention in the intro because I wanted to have like a more deeper discussion. I don't even think that we talked about it in our pre-call, but when doing a little research, you know, we, we do work a little bit when we have, you know, I mean, we like to crack jokes, but we are professionals, kind of. Get the job done. Uh, yeah. You talk a little bit in your article, the Fast Company article, about the fact that you had dyslexia. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so just so I've, I'm recapping here for our viewers and listeners, goes to school from the city, has dyslexia, gets into the Wharton School of Business, creates his own company, and I believe with some colleagues from Wharton. No, actually, uh, solo. Yeah. Solo? solo? How did you overcome the first part? You know, that's a big thing to overcome. How did you do that? Or how are you continuing to deal with it, right? Yeah. And I mean, part of that is like, shout out to my parents. My mom and dad were, I mean, they were really aware of sort of when I was, you know, much younger in school, how I was doing. They wanted to keep a close eye on things. And they decided to get me tested for dyslexia, which is, I mean, a little bit of a process. And sure enough, it was, you know, hey, I'm dyslexic. And so they really took the time to do the research and talk with people and understand, like, what is the best education for someone with dyslexia? And we were fortunate enough to find the Windward School, which was originally just out in Connecticut, and it recently opened up a campus in New York. And I went there. And that was probably the best move that it could have made. Because traditional sort of education and a lot of the schools out there, sort of you go in, they have their own way of teaching, their own way of sharing knowledge, et cetera. And if you don't fit that sort of status quo, then you're sort of left out on the sidelines, right? They're not going to change their way of teaching for one or two kids in the classroom. And so what Winward does is they've created this new, you know, approach to, you know, teaching and, and you know, uh, growing students. Um, and I think that's just worked really well for a lot of kids that have learning-based disabilities. And both of my brothers went there as well. And, you know, one's now at USC Marshall studying business and the other's at a VA playing tennis. Wow. Were they dyslexic as well, or was that just you? Yeah, both of them. Yep. Wow. Comes in the family. Yeah. Yeah. That is unbelievable. Yeah, man. That's quite a feat. Yeah. It was, I mean, look, it was, uh, Hey, we learned a lot. We're still, you know, obviously we love the school. I actually went back a couple months. Actually, no, it was last year at this point. 
for one of their events and spoke to the kids there about building hopscotch and sort of my journey mm. and you know, spent a lot of fun supporting that school. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful, man. So since we're on the subject of, I feel like I'm kind of backtracking here. I apologize, but can you explain to the audience a little bit exactly what hopscotch is and Secondly, second part of that question is, was there a certain instance or an impetus that kind of drove you to like, wow, the world really needs this? You know, what was that moment for you? Yeah, for everyone out there, Hopscotch is this all-in-one payments platform that today helps thousands of freelancers and SMBs more easily manage their invoicing and bill pay, right? On the surface, it doesn't sound like the sexiest topic. But we like to think of ourselves as more of a Venmo or Cash App for business to business. Mm. So the transactions are real time. They're fee free. Okay. So you're not going to get hit with transaction fees, et cetera. And you can link your Hopscotch account to an accounting software like QuickBooks, Zero, et cetera, to more easily reconcile and classify transactions. But we're designed to look and feel like a consumer app, which, you know, was a pretty heavy burden on, on, uh, you know, these individuals that are using systems out there today. Mm. Fascinating. The Venmo wow. cash app for business to business payments. And I, and I have to say, you know, listeners, viewers, I, I had to, you know, try it out to see if it was any good. Couldn't have the brother on the podcast and, 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 and it not work. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I mean, that would be a little, this shit don't work. And we have you on the show. Like, <laughs> that, that's no good. So I, I tried it out. I would just assume that we would probably leave that part out. <laughs> I'm on the show. So, I mean, it works. <laughs> it does what it says it does. Right, you know right. I mean? Founder says it works. It works. I believe him. No, no. I tried it out and it was pretty, it was very seamless. It was very similar to that experience with Vemo. And um, what I like about it the most is just the simplicity of it. The UX design, I think, is great and simple. And I think... A lot of times people start crowding things in, more features, more this, more that, and all of a sudden what made it awesome was kind of lost. You know what I'm saying? Like, so uh, yeah, it works. Well, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I, that's one of the things with like our design team and, and front end team is like challenging them to add more features that we're getting requests for, but to not make it more complicated, you know, keep that simplicity at its core. I think they've done a great job thus far. It's so good to hear. Oh, yeah. What was the actual, was there something, the second part of Rick's question too, was there an actual event or something that really sparked like, yeah, I got to fix this? Was there a specific frustration that you felt specifically that gave you the idea? Yeah, well, I mean, to go back, you know, I mentioned that I had started an apparel company, right? And at that apparel company, we manufactured all of our clothing from scratch. So we'd work with a handful of vendors to be able to do that. And the really... You know, difficult thing is that all of these vendors wanted payment via, you know, different systems. Some wanted, you know, payment via paper check, et cetera. And so it was a pain to manage all of this, right? It was just always so complicated. But at that time, I just kind of thought, hey, this is the way that business is done. And that was that. But then at that music streaming startup, you know, getting exposure to a lot more of the online payment systems that are out there, like Bill.com, like a QuickBooks invoicing, and going in and trying to use these systems. It was just, it was so complicated. And if yes. you look at what we're using today as individuals to send money to friends or, you know, family, et cetera, it's so simple. It's fast and free, right? Like three things that just are, it make common sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of the aha moment that, hey, like there really isn't an experience that we have in the consumer world that exists today in the business to business payments world. Unbelievable. That whole raising process, raising funds as a startup, there are more black owned businesses out there or are more black owned uh, startups out there. How has that experience been for you so far? What have been some of the highlights and then like some of the big challenges? I know a lot of listeners and viewers probably have their own ideas and maybe come from different areas and look like, you know, you, I and Rick. So what was that experience like? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be naive, right? Like raising venture funding is hard, right? Like first and foremost, like full stop, raising VC capital is very, very difficult for anyone from any background. Then if you throw in sort of all of these other factors into the equation, right? So being a minority, being young, someone without a college degree, et cetera, 
you know, it makes it a little bit more challenging. Going into it, though, I really didn't think about any of that stuff. And I don't know if it was on purpose or if it was just sort of, you know, by design, it just didn't come to mind. But throughout the whole process, I tried not to think about the biases that, you know, the investors I was speaking with might have. And I never viewed any rejection as, oh, it's a rejection because of, you know, I'm X or Y or Z or whatever it is. And I think the venture world has a lot more to do to make sure that the capital is equally distributed across diverse founders. But I think, you know, founders also have to be careful not to dismiss rejections as being a result of your background or whatever gender, whatever it may be, right? Like there are times, right, that is fully the case and that the investor is making some assumptions based off of that, mm -hmm. right? But there are also times where you learn a lot through the, the comments they make and the rejection email or whatever it is. So for me, I just try to push through and, you know, see the best companies, you know, get funded and that's that. Maybe that's a hot take, I'm, you know. <laughs> hot take, no, no, I found the answer. I don't want to say refreshing, but it's real. You know, it's being a minority in this country is not easy, but at the same time, you can't make it a handicap. So at the same time, you just got to keep grinding and look at every rejection as an opportunity to improve, you know? So yeah, I mean, if you're being a realist on one side, like, yeah, that stuff happens. But like, I can't sit here and complain and not think that the feedback wasn't about the product because, you know, the feedback could be really about the product. So I appreciate that view. But there are, there are, of course, a ton of instances where it's just, it's the complete opposite, right? It's not just the product, but it's some bias that person has, et cetera. So like I said, the VC community, obviously there's still more work to be done. And I think that's across the board, not just in VC, but other industries. I think there's been some, you know, forward movement, but again, there's still much so a lot more to do as a founder, you know, it's very possible that I experienced some of that as well. Hmm. So as a business owner, and this is just a general question, but what are your views on remote work? We were, so we have a hybrid environment here. A portion mm -hmm. of our you know, team members work remotely, right? Okay. And then the ones that are here in the tri-state area, they'll come in, you know, a few days a week and then work remotely the remainder of the week. And what I would say is like, I think remote work is a good thing, right? Like it expands the talent pool. You get to create more diverse teams, right? Mm. And like overall, I think it's had a measurable impact on productivity, right? Like when people are home, they can be in their own space in their own environment and just focus on whatever the task at hand is. That being said, we're a seed state startup and I'm in our office right now, right? We have a physical space. And so I think that physical collaboration is so, so important when you're trying to build a company, trying to build a culture and get these people who have never met before to work together to build this platform. So I'm in the middle. I'm, <laughs> I'm in the middle. No, that's yeah. good. That was a great response. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we are literally here for a discussion. We're not trying to browbeat remote work into everybody that turns on our show. I mean, it is the best work modality by a landslide, you know, and everything reset is bullshit. But I mean, like, you know, yeah, it is great. You know what I mean? Well, there's a slight bias in your tone, and I don't care for it, mister. <laughs> Look, I, I, so I, I work from the office like three days a week, and then, you know, three or four days a week, and then I'll work from home once or twice a week. And I try to make it so that, you know, if I have meetings with other team members, right, like we have those meetings in office, we can use the whiteboard, things like that. But then on days where I know I have fewer meetings, you know, and I, I want to get more work done, working from home helps me do that. So like there is a balance, but, you know, the one thing I will say, and I'm curious what you guys have seen on just on the podcast is like early stage startups that are fully remote, it's difficult to build that camaraderie, right? That was one of the the reasons we got in office. I also think though, it just, it, you can have preferences. I think that's the other thing that we're losing in a lot of this talk that we're hearing. It's your company. Like it's okay for somebody to say, Hey, look, this is the company that I want to build. And this is kind of how I want to build it. And I think that's okay. But there are obviously plenty of startups that have been able to do what you were talking about being fully remote and building that type of relationships but 
maybe those relationships are different. What they consider great relationships may be different than what you consider great relationships. And, you know, depending on the application that you're building, how async can they be versus, you know, how async could we be? So, yeah, I, I, I do want to give people the understanding that, yes, I believe that being fully remote is the way of the future. It's the way of where we all want to be as, as like part of society as far as being free to do what we want to do when we want to do it, travel and work. But at the same time, I understand if a company wants to have people come into the office every now and then. To me, I just feel like coming into the office for the sake of it and not having a good plan and not having good intentions, I feel like that is just more of a historical conditioning that we're used to. We, you know, we've been used to that. Yeah, because it, it really, it's like an open door for people to like kind of dismiss culture and human connection. Like if you're forcing everybody to come back to work without even thinking about your office culture and whether or not people are happy working there together in office, you're going to have a problem. Confirm. Yeah, you're right. And like, I think <laughs> there is, there is sort of the attitude, right? Like on one side of the spectrum where it's like, you need to be in office, not just because you want collaboration, but it's more of like, you need to be in office because I want to know that you're actually doing work, which I think yeah. is misguided, right? If you're building a team, you should trust your team members to be doing the work that needs to be done to get your business to the next level. So if that's yeah, the reason yeah. you have the office, that's the reason you have to tell people to come into the office. I don't think that's right, right? Mm. But then on, on the remote side, like I think you have a valid point, Kaleem, where it's like the future is probably going to be remote, right? It makes sense from you know a company perspective. But I think like I'm a big fan of hybrid, obviously. And I think one company yeah. that's done some really like cool things is Salesforce, where it's like these offices are these they have a literal ranch for those who don't know, like you have these places that, you know, your team members can call home base and come to build relationships, build a culture, et cetera, but they're still doing the majority of the work remotely. So I, I like that. That seems, that seems right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also like the idea of like, Hey, if you're going in the office and you just want to hang out and connect with like your colleagues, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, to me, that's what I would want to do. Like back to you, know, you, you said this earlier, like where I, when I don't have meetings, I don't have a lot of work to do. You're like, oh, wait, I mean, meetings are work. <laughs> you like kind of caught yourself. Yeah. Like, oh, oh. I mean, they are work, but. Got <laughs> in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, I understood what you meant, right? Like you mean like when I have to do heads down code review, maybe, or something that's going to be really intense, writing something, you're like, look, I need to be in my spot uninterrupted. So. You know, having everybody on the show that's 100% all remote, work from anywhere, let's be, let's all be digital nomads. Everybody can't be like that, so. Well, it kind of leads to a one-sided conversation, eventually. <laughs> you know? Just to throw it in there, like, I think it that's... cuts both ways too, right? Where it's not just on, like, from the, you know, company's leadership, you know, sort of responsibility to set, like, the culture and the expectations around remote work and working in office, et cetera. But then also, like, from the employee perspective, right? Like sure. there's some videos out there that have gone viral of like these people that take advantage of their company's policies where maybe a company wants people based in the US so that they're all in the time zone, but then they go travel to Bali or something and live there for two months and pretend that they're in the States. Like there are all of these like nuances and these things that people can do to take advantage of remote work. But if we all really are like a true fan of remote work and we think that it's good for productivity, it's our job also to make sure that we don't take advantage of it and that we use it responsibly. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. My thing to the Bali thing, I love, I love the one about where people are having multiple jobs and people get so upset about that. And I'm like, well, look, your KPI is no good because that means you can't, like earlier when you're talking about coming into the office and being able to tell if somebody's working, well, in a startup world, when you have to scale, you know, you're preparing to scale someday. Oh, you know, yeah, you'll know. You know, you're getting ready. Like, there's going to be a day where we read, you know, hey, you know, Hopscotch just got, you know, 10 million, 20 million in funding and boom, right? 
well, you got to hire like 50 people or 100 people quickly. And if you don't have your KPIs, your policies, your procedures available for you to determine what productivity is and measurable so that you can view it, like you're really in for a rude awakening when you have 150 employees and you have no idea how to measure productivity. So like when you hear people say, oh, well, like come back so that you know you're working, it's just like, well, bro, you should already know that regardless of where they are. That's very true. <laughs> like, what, what do you think about, you mentioned working two jobs at once. Like what do you, like, I mean. I love it. You like it? I love that. But do you think that causes problems though? Or I mean, like would you work two jobs at once without your employer knowing or? Yeah, why not? In my opinion, my thought is, am I really performing at both gigs high or even good enough for them not to fire me? And if that's the case, what does it matter? Oh, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> so so is, it, is it my fault, dog, that you're not giving me enough or you don't have enough work to fulfill my plate? Like, is that my responsibility? to come to you and say, I don't have, you're not giving me enough. Or if I write a script that reduces my work down to 25%, like what do I get for that, for the reward? I just get more work. Well, I think also this goes into like the responsibility of the employee where like, hey, you do something that like increases your productivity, right? Like you write a script or whatever that just like, you just run it, you set it, forget it, you know, do something else, work your second job, and your employer doesn't know that setup and that you're already, you're saving all this time and you have this bandwidth. Like, I would say that's, you know, that's not necessarily moral, right? But if it's, you've told your employer like, hey, I've done this thing that cuts my workload in half. I have this time available. It's there and they don't use it. Then at that point, you know, it makes sense where you then can go use that time for something else. I get that. But I think, you know, my sort of, philosophy is you should always be transparent and forthcoming. And I'm the same way with my team about how the business is performing and what expectations are. And in return, I'd expect that they're fully transparent with me with, you know, everything that they're doing and what they would expect from me and from the company as well. So more of a relationship versus you work for me. Exactly. Like, I think, you know, and look, I, unfortunately, I think, you know, larger companies, right, just by default, when you have 30,000 people working somewhere and you're just sort of a number in a spreadsheet, there is the tendency that people will sort of feel like, hey, I'm just, you know, I don't really mean anything, right? Like I'm not doing something that maybe have a material impact for this company. And so who cares if I do what I need to do, I can just go work the second job, mm -hmm. right? That's their attitude, right? But I can tell you from a manager perspective, Right, like everyone, or at least at a smaller company, everyone is doing something that has a material impact on our growth. And I like to treat them as, you know, I like to build those relationships. And so they're not just this number or whatever it may be. Um, mm. Maybe I'm rambling here, but I, I no, hope you No, 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 no. I mean, you're just speaking right to me. There's a difference, you know, like hmm. I can see it in your eyes. You're saying, well, geez, if we're transparent with each other, it's not about to you, it didn't seem like the fact that they were working two jobs was the issue that you had. It was more about the issue of not being trustworthy and transparent. Um, yeah, and and look, I think yeah. at any point in time, like if we've grown to a point where people are working and can work two jobs, well, at that point, it's probably like, we probably grew too fast and we shouldn't have so many people. Like that's just yeah. a sign of being irresponsible as a leader of a company. Um, wow. From my Wow. You hear that, listeners? That's on point. You see that, viewers? He literally just broke it down. Like, hey, back to those TikToks, those people that were working two jobs, don't fire them. Look at yourself. Look at yourself. <laughs> it's you. That's what Reed says. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, the, and then you should trim the company because they shouldn't be working. You know, you shouldn't have enough for people to be working full time. If they are working full time, if they're a part time employee, that's a, you know, different that's complete. Story. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Agreed. Agreed. So, Reed, we are at the point in the show and I know all of our listeners and our viewers are just chopping at the bit for me to oh, ask you this question. At the bit, Bob, at the bit. I can see Kaleem's eyes starting to get a little wide. He gets a little crazy at this point of the show. My eyes don't open very wide for some reason. I just don't understand it. Don't do not do that. You're scaring me. <laughs> Could you tell us about a 
memorable, perhaps something comical or, or inspiring, maybe a moment that you had while working remotely that really sticks out to you? Yes. <laughs> One thing in particular comes to mind. Um, I don't, you know. Yeah, share, baby. You know I mean? He's cheesing hard, bro. I, he's, he's cheesing hard. Over here. I, it's like a mixture of embarrassing, but like just unexpected. It's uh, anyway. So, um, <laughs> I have this thing where, like, at home, right? Like, if I'm drinking water or coffee, whatever it is, I'll put it into a wine glass, just because it, like, wine glasses hold more, you know, liquid, whatever it is, right? So it's just more efficient. So I was on this call where I was drinking water off a, out of a wine glass. And my team thought I was drinking wine the whole time. And so later in the call, you know, someone sort of called it out and it was uh, it was unexpected. But it's like one of those things where it's just, you know, it's just it's easier. Uh, it holds Were you more. uncomfortable in that moment? I was. Yeah, I'm probably a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> now. But, you know, yeah. Well, was... what, well, what happened? We got to get a picture. So you I mean, you, you're having this serious thing talking about we got to get APIs and shits and, you know, <laughs> we got to get this stuff done. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we got to talk to the banks and the money and you're sitting yeah. there, you're swifting it around, right? Like, 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 oh, no, no, I, I, it's like in the corner and like every once in a while, like I, I pick it up and I take a sip, not realizing like, okay, my camera's on. They're probably like, what the hell are you doing? What and time like, is this meeting? meeting. What time and is this meeting? In the morning. This was in the morning. So like clearly <laughs> not acceptable if it were wine, which it were it was not, you know. <laughs> But like from the team's perspective, they're like, this is, and it's a Tuesday. It's not even a Friday. It's a Tuesday. I love it. It's Tuesday at 9, 14 a.m. I love it. Exactly. And I'm over here, just, you know, going like this, blah, blah, blah. But, and we got to do know, better, it's... damn it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's 9, 14 and then... on a Tuesday. It looks like he's into the Manhattan Reserve again. We got to call no one, the boss on this one. No one said anything until the very end. Like someone pulled me aside and be like, Reed, like, are you okay? Like we saw the wine glass. Oh. Like that. So I was like, that was water. <laughs> and I just thought it was so normal because I've done this for so long where I just, I use a wine glass. Reed, for time out, time out, time out. You're telling me you thought your whole life that it was so normal to drink water out of a wine glass. <laughs> so nor it was normal for me to do that, like myself, but I didn't really like, cause I'd been working from home um, for, you know. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. I wasn't thinking that like, hey, oh, someone would think like, you know, what are you doing? But yeah. That's a good one. It's, you know, that, that's interesting cause my 10 year old daughter loves to drink lemonade out of a martini glass. She just thinks it's fancy. Well, look at that. He's been doing it for years and I haven't thought anything of it. And we had a get together not that long ago. And she's sitting there and, you know, lemonade looks like a <laughs> from Manhattan. You know what I mean? It's right. like everybody's yeah. going, is she, is she really, do you, do you know what yeah. you're drinking? And I'm like, no. And I went with that. I'm like, she can't be drinking that. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just the glass that makes it look like it. Yeah. You know, nah, Rick, in that shit, in that shit today, because if you don't, She's going to be called Mrs. Margarita by seventh grade. End it today. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I should. You're right. You're right. Yeah, I should. Reed, thank yeah, you so cool. much, man. That I mean, that is a hilarious story. I appreciate that one. I, I wish yeah. I could have just been there seeing the face of the other people and like them honestly being concerned for you. Like, yeah, I was like saying something important. And I was like, are, what, like, are you guys, is this the message not resonating? They're giving me these books. <laughs> And then I find out that, okay, it's because of the wine glass. But, Holy you know. smokes, there's Good tears. Lord. There's that Karen tears everywhere. I mean, it, it <laughs> must have been horrific. Mr. Schweitzer, where can people find you on social media, sir? You can find a company at Try Hopscotch on all social media platforms. You could uh, you know, check out our website, gohopscotch.com. And you can sign up for the platform there. If you're a freelancer, a small business owner, you know, in the creative space, so graphic designer, you know, branding agency, et cetera, definitely encourage you to sign up. We have a bunch of features that could help you optimize your business, your cash flow, et cetera. So give us a try. And if you need anything, feel free to shoot me a note personally. Read R E E D at gohopscotch.com. My inbox is always open. Reed Schweitzer, you are a super sport. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate <laughs> you, man. It was a good time, man. Yeah. And if anyone else out there also drinks water and wine glasses, shoot me a note. I'd love to meet. Uh, <laughs> <I'll do that. laughs> 
I will forever remember today is the day I started drinking water out of a wine glass. Hey, it's less trip <laughs> to the you know to get water. It's just it makes. I mean, I didn't know that. It was a good. That's a good fact to learn. I just assumed yeah. that the, they were round and you just thought that they were cool looking. Oh, it's just yeah, more yeah. efficient. That's it. Amazing. That's amazing. Well, thanks again, cool, Reed. Man. Come back anytime, sir. Appreciate I you. Appreciate it. Awesome. You've been listening to the Remotely We Are One podcast. Visit us at remotelyone.com slash podcast for upcoming episodes. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and download our episodes on your favorite podcast app. Hey, hey, don't forget to clock out.